So again, uh, I'm, I'm assuming our back, uh, uh, we all have different backgrounds. So I'm going to start from scratch and assume you know, you know very little or, or nothing at all. Uh, and if I'm incorrect, I apologize. But it's good to start from, from basics. So AI and machine learning, what, what jumps into most people's minds is some kind of Terminator, some kind of you know, sci-fi uh, envisioning of machines that think just like you and I, just like humans. Uh, a good future example, perhaps, maybe not Terminator, but we're slowly getting there. Uh, there are uh, intelligent machines that have weapons, things like that, of course, but it's a much bigger field uh, and it will often cover uh, smaller things. Uh, so again, it's a, a wide array of, sorry, let me just get my screens here. It's a wide array of, of tasks that are being done, and especially now, we're not really into the sci-fi realm. Uh, we all, often, I just refer to now, AI machine learning is not new. Uh, this has been around since, depending on how you count, since the 60s or 70s. Uh, the main reason why it's become big now is because it's easily accessible. Essentially, anyone can do it. Uh, and GPUs have become cheap and extremely powerful. So going from CPU to GPU for machine learning has made it a, a lot easier for uh, to run, a lot easier to do image processing, and it's gone over to commercial GPUs, meaning anyone could do it on their gaming computer. Uh, I like to define it as something like this. It's trying to develop software that makes what we think easy tasks. Um, Autom automated. So speech recognition, image recognition. Uh, this is, of course, something that you know a toddler can do. It's very easy for us, but for a computer, a standard computer program, it's very tricky. Uh, I don't. I hope you all can see the face here in the image I posted, uh, because this is actually quite cool in how difficult it is to get a computer to realize that this is a human face. Sorry, all my screens jumped again. While you try and see that face, let me just get them out. There we go. So what we do today, uh, and again, this may change. We, we are on the forefront of many things, is that we get computers to try and learn from their experience and try and understand things as concepts so we don't try to write, you know, uh, jokingly, I think everyone adds in, you know, an AI is just loads of if statements. That's not the case. It just becomes too unmanageable. And in most cases, that's just not going to work. There are, on the other hand, many cases where if statements will work, where AI is perhaps a waste of time. But let's not go into the economics of this. Uh, everyone likes jumping onto the AI bandwagon. And uh, the reason for this, the main reason for this, for jumping into, from learning from data, so that is actually where, where machine learning comes from. We, we say that it learns from data, is that we don't have to sit down and write if statements. Now, why is this important? Is it because we're lazy? Well, that's one part, yes. But what if we're wrong? What if fundamentally we have misunderstood the problem? Uh, a good example of this can be, um, classifications of people with different ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, what if we're biased? What if we are, um, you know, have some uh, hidden agenda? Well, the AI won't get that. It will try and, it, it, it is an AI, it is a computer program, it is objective. On the other hand, you can feed it incorrect data, you can feed it data which is already biased. And that is one of the big problems now in AI is how do we not only train it correctly so that it is impartial and objective, but also how do we verify this? And there are, in the news almost daily, there are examples where this has gone very, very wrong. Um, did I, sorry, yeah, in a, in a while I'll get to, uh, I'll redefine what we mean by AI more fundamentally, but this is good to give us a, a a kind of an overview. Um, so 
the difference between AI, the general world, word, and machine learning is the learning part. Uh, if we can teach computers to make, let's see, let's say decision, smart decisions, and we can, I'm sorry, I will restart that sentence. Uh, so with machine learning, so the learning part, we can not only get our, our code, our if statements, essentially, but we can now ch change them depending on what data we feed in, and they we can make them change if the data changes. So an algorithm trained on, let's say, uh, travel patterns before corona can be used after corona because you can simply retrain it on the new data that you have. And this is, of course, great for finance, for medicine, for anything where you have this change over time and where one algorithm developed 10 years ago simply won't work today. And you don't then have to pay uh, a developer to change it. You just simply retrain on data. I say simply, it's not maybe not always sim so simple. Uh, two examples of this that you see in your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I wrote here logical, logistic regression for medical decision-making. That is true, but also for things like commuter timetables. Uh, essentially, anything where you have loads and loads of people uh, or loads and loads of data points, and the distinction is very simple. You want a binary answer. It's usually uh, essentially a two-dimensional problem, but there are loads of variables around it. Uh, the other thing is uh, na na naive Bayesian filtering, which is what's used for spam filters today. And it works surprisingly well. Uh, you have a list of words which uh, it recognizes as spam, and if it finds them in your email, it, it jumps through it. Uh, so this is, at least publicly, still what Google uses for its spam filter. And that's the best one I've come across. Uh, if anyone has any other uh, good ones, please let me know. Um, the thing with AI is, again, it requires data, loads amount of data, and it requires good data. Uh, this is the trick. This is why big companies will pay a lot of money to send images of cars, images of stop signs to um, a country where labor is cheap and get them to simply put a square around where the sign is or uh, to recognize what train is coming in on a train timetable. Uh, most of these methods uh, will also be very good at understanding the technical aspect, but actually not that good at understanding, well, images. For, pic for instance, if you take a 1,000 by 1,000 picture, so slightly smaller than your screen, depending on which screen you have, you know, that's 1,000 times 1,000 pixels. How correlated are they? So if you have an image of a stop sign, how many pixels in that sign tells you stop? Is it a close-up picture? Is it a far away shot picture? It all depends. And this makes it, again, maybe not more difficult, but it makes all these naive AI methods difficult to use because you need to think one more step. You can't just throw in data. Maybe you have to pre-process it. Maybe you need an algorithm to find signs in images and then try and classify them as stop signs or some other type of sign. Uh, there is an online book. I have the link here. I can post that in the chat as well, I thought. Uh, I will post it in the chat later on. Uh, and they have a great definition to get all these terminology into, uh, into account. So what do we mean by AI? What do we mean by machine learning, representation learning, and deep learning? So sorry, I didn't mention that, but what I was talking about before, so several algorithms working in line, that's essentially deep learning. And taking all these terms into account, we can then put down a simple definition. Uh, not everyone agrees, especially among experts, but it's a, a definition and it's clear cut. So what do we mean by AI? What classifies as AI? Well, let's put that as simply as we can anything that seems smart. Does that mean a coffee machine? Yes, a coffee machine can be AI. Does it mean your computer? Absolutely. Essentially, anything can be classified as AI, uh, according to this book. And I like that definition. It's very simple to, and straightforward. If I find it to be intelligent, then it's AI. Okay, simple, elegant, perfect. 
Uh, one example of this they put in here, knowledge bases. So essentially any database, essentially loads of if statements. If it seems intelligent to the user, it's AI. Good enough. Machine learning then. Well, then we require learning. We require that it's from data. Uh, and this data, again, can be a table of values, it can be images, it can be video, it can be sound, that doesn't really matter. But from this data, it changes its behavior. So if I ask it to identify, you know, phone numbers in data, it will learn from the data. It's not depending on my statements, but actually what's in the data. And that, of course, might require me to give it pre-processed data. So where I have data and I have some classification next to it. Simple enough? So far, so good. Representation learning. So this is actually quite cool and often not talked about. People just jump into deep learning. This is kind of its own separate field where we're talking more about giving it dirty or unprocessed data. So uh, for instance, uh, and that's the example they have here, autoencoders. I wanna send you a picture. I wanna send it over a 56K modem, so very low bandwidth. I want it to go quickly. Which pixels do I send? Or what information in the image do I send? This is essentially what representation learning will, will do. It will find the best way of representing your image or your data um, to, in this case, minimize data loss or maximize data speed. Uh, examples of this, well, I know WinRAR uses this and 7-Zip. Uh, if it's active or not, I don't know. There's a tick button, at least on the Windows version. Uh, and then it will literally try and find the best way to compress your data with minimal loss. Uh, again, okay, that can be interesting. Uh, but what's really interesting is this is the first step into deep learning. So this is how we would combine several algorithms where we don't really want to add in human touch to the data processing. We want it to be objective, we want it to be simple. Uh, and as we mentioned before, so one of these things could be if we have pictures of uh, from the streets, well, the best representation for our system would be just, just signs. And that's what uh, such a system would find after it has been trained. Uh, I think I've mentioned deep learning a few times, or at least now, a few good examples. So according to their definition, deep learning becomes any, exam, uh, any system where we add multiple uh, machine learning examples after each other, or uh, as uh, you may have, if you have encountered this before, any system where we have depth, so several layers of uh, neurons in a neural network, for instance. Uh, and there, there, this happens under the skin, but this is essentially what happens between different layers, that it will learn how to represent the data and next step and next step and next step. So far, so good, or any questions? No one's raised their hand, so I think I'll just babble on and then hopefully we can get to our example quickly or our hands on quickly. Um, do I need to talk about this? Maybe it's worth talking a bit about this, that AI is a buzzword, just like IoT, just like Bitcoin or blockchain or loads of things. It does not mean it's not useful. Definitely not. It can be very useful, but it doesn't mean you have to use it everywhere. There are far too many AI companies or startups that jump out there and they want to use this, but they don't really understand where or how. And if eventually they go bankrupt. Uh, too many examples I found in industry where, you know, the push is let's go for AI. What they actually just need is plain, simple data science, which is great because that gives them a profit, but there was no AI involved. Um, and they learned that the hard way after losing quite a bit of money. Um, the other part, in many cases is, it's all depending on the data. Uh, you can build the best model, you can train it for days, years, but if the data is terrible, that is going to be just ter uh, the most difficult part for you. Whereas cleaning up the data, understanding the data, that makes it much easier. 
that can mean going from a very complex model to a much simpler model. Uh, and let's say, don't get stuck in this idea that it's a black box. There is no black box. What, what that means practically is yes, we don't really know how the system works, but you could say that about any big block of code written by someone else. Uh, we can, on the other hand, probe it. We can see what it gives out for data and we can understand it. But it's not like we can jump in and see what the code looks like line by line. It is a model that is trained. And jumping in to see what each neuron does doesn't really give us that understanding. Uh, as always, worth mentioning in any data science is just because the model says so doesn't mean there's actually any logic to, to base this on. The model bases it on data. The data might say so, but that might not be the truth. Uh, there's a great example of an AI that learned that everyone that was wearing red clothes uh, worked at a, the same company. Well, they might have had a preference, but that wasn't true. Um, but of course, the AI worked fine. Uh, it's the same in uh, medicine. There's a great example where we had an AI that detected, uh, oh, can I remember? It was something to do with the heart. It was something lethal. I can't remember the medical term uh, for exactly the condition. But you know, it was 90% accurate. One of the best models you've ever seen in medical AI. Yes, it found that on x-rays from critical patients, there's a small logo saying something like emergency x-ray or portable x-ray, which is only used on patients who are too critical to move. And yeah, they're probably not going to make it. They probably have this fault at this hospital. But that was the only thing I looked at. It ignored patients and it was 90% accurate. Great. Uh, oh yeah, of course. But it found something that did not belong. It was true in the data that it was being fed, but it was there was no correlation between these uh, events. Let me just, let's see, there is a bit done uh, to do before we jump into hands-on. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly and then you can read it on uh, if you're interested. Uh, the definition of learning, just so you have it in the back of your head, we say that a computer program is learning from an experience E with respect to some class of task T and performance measure P if performance at task in T as measured by P improves with experience E. Uh, a bit, you know, technical, but it's it gives us a great uh, basic understanding. You know, this is our definition of learning. So we're going to perform some task T. We're going to measure how we do this task somehow with P, and we have to improve with some definition of experience. These class, uh, these these tasks. Sorry, I've added a few examples here: classification, regression, parsing, you name it. Performance can be accuracy, can be measuring output from zero to one or zero and one. Uh, this is usually the more most difficult part, I should say, finding a good way of determining performance. And experience here can either be iterating through data that is classified, so we know the right answer answer, um, but maybe for a small subset, or where we're just trying to cluster all data. So again, sorry for jumping through that, but uh, you can read that in the notes when we're doing the hands-on, if you're interested. Uh, I just mentioned there slightly that we split data. So one, one difference in machine learning compared to normal, um, normal coding is we don't want the algorithm to be trained on all data. We need some way of validating that it's not literally just writing if statements, but that it's actually learning and finding this fundamental representation of data. So we split this into three sets. One is called training, one is called testing, and one is called, well, I, I define it as real. It's hard finding the, a good name there. Training is what we use for the algorithm. This is what gives us how well it performs and how to improve. So trying to get the best classification of this data. Testing is to evaluate the algorithm. So we're done, we're happy, we send this to the next person or to ourselves and we say, okay, let's validate it or let's evaluate it. And real is, well, live data, proper data. 
which we actually don't know if these sets represent each other, but hopefully we've chosen these sets big enough and uh, well enough that they do. So, whew, sorry about all that talking. I uh, feel like I'm, I'm in a lecture hall. Uh, do you have any questions or should we just jump straight into the hands-on part? And please, this is a, a great time for questions. And then when we're on the hands-on part, uh, hopefully you'll have even more questions for me. No hands up. But you're still there, right? Someone can just say yeah. hi. Is it similar to like generating a validation set and then a test set and then a real set? Or is validation is something similar to test set? Uh, so most basically, uh, it would be generate everything at once. So you collect your big uh, set of data and then you split it into three categories. So say I'm out taking pictures of road signs. I don't know why I keep jumping back to that, but it's a good example. Uh, I'll take a, uh, a thousand pictures. Then I'll say, I'll save 400 of these. That will be my test set. 400 of these will be my uh, tra testing set. And 200 of these will be my real set, essentially. Uh, that last part, the real set, you don't really have to use. Uh, it's more just to give a, a good grasp of how the algorithm actually works. Maybe you've done some pre-processing on the data, uh, so you'll change your testing and training data slightly, but then you have this real set that you can always compare to and make sure that, well, does it, does it actually work or did I do something? Oh, great, I'm getting loads of writing here in the chat. How do you know about the minimum of data set and data in order to evaluate the assumption then with live data? Oh God, yes, this all depends on implementation. This all depends on examples. This all depends on what you're doing. Uh, so actually we'll be playing around with this. Um, in my experience, uh, so uh, I didn't mention that, I just wrote that quickly. So I have a PhD in, in particle physics. In physics, there's always enough data. There's never an issue. You, uh, which is great because then you don't have to think about this. In industry, I tend to find that it leans toward that as well. It's mostly in medical science where this is very difficult and you really get into trouble. Um, uh, again, it's a whole science in itself. I'm not sure I can give a good answer on how to build these sets and how big they should be, uh, but you get a feeling for it after a while and there are good recommendations. Uh, essentially, it tends to be that if your model is more complex, you need more data, but that's kind of a guideline, not always the, the truth. Going to statistics, how many variables are in the data, then go for an, that number times 10. You know, it's, it's a bit of a uh, hand wavy type thing. I hope that answered your question, Vanessa. So, unless... Unless there are any other questions, uh, let's just jump in. So I have prepared for you uh, three things. One is my own GitHub page with loads of examples. Uh, and from there, we're going to start with this initial iris data set. I'll jump into that and show you quickly. And then there is on the Google page uh, a good playground exercise. So let me just show you that here. Um, so one is this. We're going to jump into this a bit later, uh, but this is a way of playing around, getting a feel for how this works. Uh, if you, and let's say I do this correctly. So if you go in through the link I provided here, this uh, initial iris link on the right, you get to a Google Colab. So essentially you're running data on the cloud, so you don't have to install anything yourself. You can, of course, if you want. Um, this is written in Python, so hopefully you're all, well, you don't have to be Python experts, but at least you may might have run Python once or twice. Otherwise, again, please just write in the chat and I'll, I'll discuss how to run this. Uh, what I've written here, and I've literally written from scratch, is a perceptron. So one of the easiest types of machine learning algorithm there is, this is, um, and this is kind of the trick with it. It's easy, it's fundamental, but also this example, 
you could solve in a million different ways. You could write an if statement and you're done. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is getting into the field for machine learning. We're going to jump into much more difficult examples later on, but this is a great start. Uh, I think what I'll do is leave you to it. I'll just take a step back and answer your questions. Uh, all the code is here. You can run it all uh, by, for instance, going to runtime run all. And in the end, you will have a trained model uh, that does this classification for you. Um, the data itself, why it's called Iris, is uh, it's based on uh, actually free. That's the first part I do here is I sort out just uh, two classes uh, of iris flowers and they depend on I think it's length and length of the petals and of the sepals so of the stem itself uh, and you can get this lovely classification uh, this lovely separation uh, I also have if you're interested in the github page I have an extended iris uh, set which you can again open in Colab. And did I have that prepared? No, I'm sorry. Uh, where you have all three and I show different models that can be trained to identify all three classes. Uh, and we run that in the same way. And we shall see all these different models who will produce different accuracy and different plots, um, which you can see. Uh, hopefully you can see this here, even though I'm doing it live. Uh, and the more difficult thing here with having free class is we actually have two classes which are kind of superimposed on each other. So they cannot be uh, disjointed uh, with the data we've provided. But we can see different models do different things and playing around with some parameters changes uh, how this looks. And I also added the code for this visualizer, which I uh, wrote from scratch as well. Good, so that's me taking a step back. I'll start, of course, by asking, can everyone get this initial iris example to run? If not, write me in the chat. And if anything's unclear, write me in the chat or just unmute. Good luck. Hey, no, uh, great that it runs. For this, you don't have to do GPU. So uh, the quick and dirty answer is GPUs are only used for uh, image processing. Not always true, but it works nine times out of 10. For this, we're not doing uh, image data. So the data, uh, let me show you actually. Uh, so if I do after this, Uh, there. If I print X, it's actually just a table. Uh, so this is tabular data, just table values. Um, then what we do here is we're just plotting those values uh, as as you would with anything. Um, looks cooler, but we're not doing any imaging processing in the background. So again, feel free to unmute, feel free to ask any questions. That's why we're here, right? We're, we're learning together. Uh, otherwise, I'll just be standing here in the quiet.
Um, did you hear me? I do, yeah. Yeah, um, what is TPU? I saw the known and the GPU and also the TPU, but I don't know what is TPU, the runtime. So, yeah, uh, so GPU, of course, stands for Graphics Processing Unit, TPU, Tensor Processing Unit. So um, do you know what a matrix is? Yeah, tensor is like a matrix, right? Yeah, but instead of having you know two data points, you have a third dimension or more dimensions. Uh, so it's a spe special hardware for handling these. Uh, when we go to use TensorFlow, as in the name, right? Everything is technically a tensor. If you've been in MATLAB, everything's technically a matrix. So it's just a way of getting TensorFlow to run faster. Oh, so it's another kind of processor, right? Yeah. So different hardware architecture to handle tensors. Yeah, but image, image that you expanded before is also tensor, right? It's also matrix. Image is a matrix. One more time, sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, the the GPU that you expanded before, mm -hmm. it it is also for the matrix, right? Yeah, of course. Uh... Uh, it, it it's just like a normal GPU, uh, but if you run it for tensors, uh, because of the hardware, it runs slightly faster. It runs maybe slightly slower with with a normal image, but it runs fine. Okay, thanks. Actually, now that I'm looking for my code, I see that I updated it. So it's not running my Perceptron code. Uh, it's using what's based in a library called sklearn, but it's identical. Uh, and I'm not sure if you're all fluent with Python, but of course, this is not default Python. We add in a few libraries. So pandas, uh, big for essentially handling data, so handling big amounts of data. Matplot, pi, uh, matplotlib, pyplot for plotting things. NumPy, uh, essentially for Python to handle numbers properly. Uh, and then we take an sklearn where we have the data set. This is kind of our first machine learning library. Uh, we could have used TensorFlow for all this as well, but uh, TensorFlow abstracts away a lot of the basic things and makes it slightly harder to start up. And for this simple example, there's no real uh, no real need for it, especially when we're getting in. Uh, it's good to start off with this. Uh, hi. Uh, could you explain a bit uh, how you write uh, your own uh, perceptron? Yes, of course. Uh, so the code, so um, if you read the wiki, a perceptron is uh, essentially very similar to a neuron. That's why I chose it. Uh, it's uh, also similar to a line fitter, a, a line fitter in n dimensions. So you want to fit, you want to take in. Uh, sorry, thinking on on the fly is always difficult. You, you're taking in data, uh, in this case x. Uh, or did I? Let's see, where did I define it? Yep. Uh, so we're fitting x versus y. So you're taking in a, an array of data x. You have the results in y, uh, and then you want to find uh, w. So, uh, uh, vec sorry, do you know vectors and matrices or should I make it? Yeah, fix it? yeah. yeah. Uh, you're, you're trying to find W to best scalar multiply with X to produce Y. So very similar to any standard line fitting you may have done. 
Uh, I think the only difference here is there a difference will be in the for loop itself where we're not doing least square approximation directly, but instead we're doing this iteratively. So, and that is, so in this example, it seems a bit odd, but that is, let's say the more machine learning part that you're iteratively getting better, iteratively improving um, your, your weights here. Uh, and here again, it's, maybe too simple to uh, to see it but you're using the derivative to get your weight or your your w uh, vector better and better closer and closer to the best value did that make sense uh yeah uh, but uh, here i couldn't see really a huge difference between uh, like machine learning uh, and uh, deep learning because uh, perceptron it have to be uh, deep learning okay Ah, no, uh, so, and, and this is great, I, I, a perfect question. So with the book's definition, uh, this is machine learning. We have only one perceptron. There is data in and there is result out. We're doing nothing else. And then it becomes machine learning. If you add oh. two perceptrons after each other, deep learning. If you pre-process the data before giving it to the perceptron, then it's more or less deep learning. Okay, yeah, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. This is a very tricky definition. And many, many people I talk to on a daily basis say, oh, it's all deep learning. And then it's, it's good going back to at least one definition where you can stand and say, well, no, actually, one layer, then it's only machine learning. So has any, did anyone think the initial example was too easy and jump on to the uh, extended example? Or maybe not too easy, but did anyone, has anyone jumped onto the extended example? Silence. Jonas writes can. Was that for us or for me? Okay. Uh, yes, sure. So this one's the initial. I think that should work even with that code at the end. And that is the extended one. Let me just double check if that link works. That's actually one of the things I haven't tried. Uh, they might require you to have a Gmail account. Um, hoping everyone has that. If not, I'll find a way around it. Um, I can just quickly mention, so the difference, so in this first example, the initial example, that is, uh, I think I might've said this a few times already, right? This is very easy and it's actually, difficult seeing the difference between machine learning and uh, you know classical line fitting in this ex extended example uh, we're not really changing that much it's the same code but i'm adding in loads of different models so i have uh, perceptron let's see here uh, i have didn't i see it maybe i didn't make the perceptron that clear yeah, it starts with a perceptron. It then goes on to logistic regression. Uh, it then goes on to to play around a bit with some of the parameters. Uh, then I go on to, uh, you know, next model, next model, next model. So you get a feeling for not only how the different models work, but actually how they visually look like when you have two dimensional data. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yes. Uh, Bereka and Taha. Uh, so uh, again, imports in Python can be a bit uh, magical, and that's what's happening here. Is the line you're looking for? So from SKLearn, we're importing uh, a module called Datasets, uh, 
and this iris example it's the basic example for all machine learning I think it was the first one i ever came across so it's predefined so when we do data set load iris it loads up iris with uh, it's technically its own data set object uh, but there we can access data which uh, where now we take out uh, two classes class two and three and the target and target here is the results so what class does uh, so data would be uh, length the two lengths uh, for each iris uh, object and target would be the class it, it actually belongs to I hope that answered your questions great um, the one if anything uh, these data sets tensorflow has this I think almost every big machine learning library has this. The only thing to worry about is it's usually their own object. So you, probably the only time I ever jump into the documentation uh, is to understand how it's written, what the data looks like. Because sometimes you get really ugly things coming out. So I'm actually slightly allergic to, to silence. So while you guys keep on working, I'll just talk a bit about uh, how to run this locally and why uh, we're doing it in the cloud. So uh, what we're doing here is not only running it in the cloud, we're running in something called a Jupyter Notebook. Um, advantages of this, well, I just gave you a link and it, it works magically, right? Uh, practically, what this means is we're running this on Google servers. Uh, so if you added your own data, something like that, Google has access to it. Google has access to your code. Maybe an issue, may, uh, not always, but can be. Uh, there is, if we take that step first, you can run a Jupyter Notebook yourself on any server, on almost any computer. Uh, it pops up as a web server, uh, and you just use any browser to, to jump into it, and you run Python code. We can, did I have to do it here? I didn't, but you can run command line arguments as well. So you just write uh, exclamation mark, uh, pip install, something, something, something. Uh, great way of getting into this. Uh, it hides uh, a lot of things in the background and it makes Python into uh, more of a script than an actual programming language. Um, and all these cells are run, they are run individually, but uh, build up uh, the Python program in the background. So anything you run here, so the imports in this cell, carry on to the next and so on and so on. Uh, kind of a mix between, so Jupyter kind of mixes Python with Mathematica, if you've ever sat with that. Uh, there is, uh, no again, no issue with doing all this locally, copy pasting this into a Python file running on your own computer. Um, another thing you can do, uh, which I tend to do, is use Docker containers uh, to package my code. Um, not going to talk about that today, but uh, I always like mentioning it because that is a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and a good thing to get into and in how to uh, not only code properly, but also how to be able to transfer your code to someone who just needs to run it. Uh, and all these things are kind of built into uh, the whole framework around machine learning. So now on a daily basis, what I do is on my computer or my server, I build, build the code, build the model that we have to use for our medical machine learning. Uh, I then put that into a container, transfer that to our big computational cluster. And again, someone has already done all the back end. It connects to the GPUs and it just runs brilliantly. 
Uh, and then it doesn't really matter if it's one GPU or 10 or 15, that hardware uh, part is abstracted away in things like TensorFlow or PyTorch or these big libraries that are used. So getting into, let's say this proper way of uh, coding makes a lot of sense, at least to me. Uh, and I like pointing in that direction. Oh yeah, I had another link I was going to add, right? This deep learning book. So how's it going for everyone? Are you managing? Hopefully the code works for everyone as well. Great. Again, please ask anything. Uh, I'm more allergic to silence than uh, silly questions. There are no silly questions in my opinion. Uh, or even please just shout out and you want me to go for it line by line, I'll do that as well. True. Ooh, I don't know who that was, but that sounded really cool. Uh, my number one tip, hopefully it works for me as well, is to use an external microphone if you have one. Uh, and if there's too much noise in the background, just write in the chat if that's okay. Uh, let me ask a question so we get some participation going. Can everyone define what E is here, T is here, and P is? So task, experience, and performance uh, from our definitions uh, in the lecture notes, or in the notes, sorry. Sorry, I had to mute there for a fire truck. So uh, does anyone want to give, give it a go? So in the initial example that we have here, what is T for us? What is our task? Oh, don't be shy. Someone can spit it out. Perfect, yes. Now I'm getting loads of things in the chat. Uh, oh yeah, uh, I should answer that question first. We're using sklearn. What's the difference between this, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on? Um, oh. <laughs> I want to, probably the answer is abstract, abstract, abstractifying. Making it more abstract, so it's it's they're all doing the same thing, but at different levels. Uh, and the only 
kind of real difference, tangible difference I can point to to TensorFlow and PyTorch compared to sklearn is GPU usage is much easier. It's uh, it's very well hidden from the user, but there's nothing you can do in one of them that you can't do in the others. Uh, again, you might have to write more code, but that's essentially the only difference. Uh, task, uh, yes, uh, I think the two answers we've gotten here are uh, identical. We are classifying the data. We have two data points. We know a priori that there are three, uh, sorry, in this example, we know there are two classes of um, iris flowers, and we are asking it to find how to best classify these. So what, um, and in our simple example, what is the line that differs these two regions from each other? What is, and not only that, but what is the best line? Um, I think we have it here, right? Uh, uh, Varun wrote, performance is accuracy. Yes, so we defined, let's see, where did we define it? Um, so in this, it's actually difficult because I've, I've split it up so much. But let's see, where did we define our performance? So we're using the predict and the fit functions that are built in. So this is actually hidden from us. Uh, but what it's going to do is exactly what we're saying here. It's going to look at, uh, it's going to summarize and essentially uh, look at how many correct answers we get divided by total number. And that is what we're trying to improve. Uh, all the time. Of course, we're getting one here, uh, so for us it doesn't matter too much. Uh, and we get this, is it the best line? Well, well actually, that's a very, very, very difficult question. Uh, there is no best line. There is no one best line, right? We could define a million or an infinite number of lines which are equally good given this metric. So the reason it turns out just like this uh, is essentially chance, or perhaps how data is being fed to it, which data points come first. Um, and experience got the answer there as well. It's to fit the right model by learning through the data, yes. So experience here becomes feeding it more data. Uh, give it one point, well, uh, oh, actually, this is we can start discussing here how much data we need. So in this example, um, I think there was a question about this earlier, right? It's very difficult to see how many data points you need. Here, uh, we can tell that we have two classes. Uh, so we only really need three points of data to get a class. Sorry, is that me or did, do you guys also hear some background noise? Yeah, I don't think it was here, but oh, anyway, I'll, I'll continue on. Please let me know if. Let me know if you're disturbed by it and I'll see if. Uh, if we can get rid of it. Um, so in this example, we have two, we know a priori, we know it beforehand, there are two classes that we have. So would two data points do it for us? Well, yes, we need two points to make a line. We need two points to make a difference between line, but we would also need a third to verify that, uh, that we have some form of classifier that works. Uh, so in this example, it's very, very easy. All is, we have many more than three points. So we actually have more data than we need to, to learn a system, uh, to learn the system. Uh, but if we go to, let's say these, uh, more complex ones, especially where they're overlapping, it's not clear how many 
for one, it's not clear what the answer should be. And depending on what your metric is, what your accuracy measure is, it's not clear. I don't think any of them get 100, right? Oh, this key nearest neighbor does. Well, it, it says it does, but if you look carefully, I think it's cheating. Or? No, sorry, my, my mistake. I keep forgetting how, how K nearest neighbor works. No, that will get 100% in this example because no point, there's no point that's overlapping another point, but the regions are overlapping. Uh, that's why uh, K nearest neighbor is a perfect um, model, um, perfect, perfect model for this. Yes, or a perfect classifier for this uh, example. But here, again, it's not clear how many data points you need. I think there is a rule of thumb uh, for K-nearest neighbors, uh, but now I can't seem to recall it if it's 10 times the p-value or something like that. Uh, are we? Do you feel done with the initial example? Should we jump into the extended one and talk a bit about different models and what they do? Great. And again, I I do want to just get you into this. This is, we're starting off a bit slow. I'm just giving you the tools to play around with. I'm giving you loads of unknowns. Uh, in our following examples, it's going to be a bit more strict. We're going to do something a bit clearer and clear cut. And that is, you know, 100% machine learning. This is on the edge. This is machine learning, but you know, you could solve it quite simply yourself. I think you all have millions of ways you would solve this, right? Uh, so we start off with the perceptron and uh, we go from uh, two classes to three to see a bit more clearly how this works. So I, I'm not making it more complex, not really. Uh, but I just want to see, okay, what do the lines look like? What do the regions look like? And that's what we're plotting here. So my plotter will essentially not plot the lines, but will plot the regions in the color where the perceptron or the model thinks it should be. So a perceptron draws straight lines. And uh, we might have understood that from the perceptron code. It is a line fitter. The regions will have strict boundaries and they will be uh, straight lines. We get red, blue, green, and we see that. Did I pull off the accuracy? Uh, ah, I am very sorry. I missed the accuracy for for perceptron. Uh, it performs very poorly. We can see that straight away, right? We can see that it's not really covering all the blue. It's covering all the red, and it's not really covering all the green. Uh, because it it literally can't. Uh, it's written in such a way that it has to have these this center point as straight lines, and it's done the best it can. Uh, if any of you have done mathematical optimization, uh, this will come naturally to you, uh, that it's finding, let's say, the best uh, global minima. Uh, am I overstepping here? I am. It doesn't always find the best global minima, but let's go for that. There would be many other ways of solving this that may or may not be better, that might actually be slightly better or slightly worse, following the rules of straight lines and center points. But it either can't find them or it thinks that this is better given the metric or given the accuracy measure we have used. Did that make any sense? Maybe it was a bit too complex of a, of a description. Again, just just interrupt or write in the chat if, if you need me to, to re-explain it. Going then to logistic regression, the main difference we see here is there's no need for this center point. We can we can use different we can have regions that are totally different from each other. So for this, for the first one, for the perceptron, we need this, sure it's n dimensional, not one dimensional line. We need a center point. We don't for logistic regression. 
So here we can actually start talking about uh, accuracy. It's actually very good. There is a parameter here that I plopped in and you can read about what this parameter actually does. Uh, but if we change this, we can see our accurate, um, it changes how it weighs the length versus the, versus the width. What is the most important parameter to use? Did I use the same parameters? Length and width. Yes, I think I wrote the wrong thing here. Good catch. Sorry for catching that live. Um, but essentially, uh, the accuracy stays the same. It just changes which parameter to use uh, initially more. So which one seems to be the, uh, the one that gives us the most difference in data. Uh, if we were to do, an, let's say, a five-dimensional data, so we have five data points for each iris, uh, you would want to plot two versus each other before jumping into a model. Uh, and see if you can see which variable combination gives the most dif differentiation between the different classes. So for, for us here, it's very, very easy, even though there is a bit of an overlap. In some other uh, data dimension, there might not be overlap. So if we had, let's go for petal color, maybe. Maybe these classes do not overlap at all. And of course, our model becomes as easy as uh, in the initial example. Uh, SVC, support vector machine, very similar to a perceptron uh, code-wise, but again, it does not have the same boundary. It's very similar to logistic regression. All these three are actually very similar, uh, but again, small differences. And I would recommend you go into the Wikipedia page and read up on these. And then if you're interested, look in the code itself. And uh, for this, we can change between a linear kernel. So essentially, we're asking it to use a linear equation or a radial equation. And you can see from at least straight lines, even though they're not meeting, to slightly bend, right? At least the blue one here, giving us, well, here it's not giving us more accuracy, but uh, it looks like it's on the right way. Uh, and here I play around with some parameters, especially in the latter part, where we can do what's called overtraining and undertraining. So uh, these terms will come up, uh, especially when you start jumping into this properly. So, uh, and this is what you try and avoid by having a training set and a testing set. Will the model actually learn how to do things, i.e. what we're seeing here? It seems to classify okay. It seems to extend the classification regions in a reasonable way. Or no, it's actually just learning how to do this for the exact data points we've given. So here it's assuming everything is green, except for the specific region where we have blue and the specific region where we have red. What if I add another data point? What if I add a red point here? It fails because it has overtrained. It has over. Again, I always get these mixed up. Uh, I'll, I'll Google them when I, <laughs> to the, you should Google them to have a, uh, uh, you should Google them to make sure I say these correctly. Overtraining model means it's, uh, it's too complex a model for the data. So it overestimates, which is what we've done here. We should only really be expecting three lines for this model but here, the model has got enough complexity to uh, bound, bind the entire blue set and red set. Underfitting, on the other hand, is when the model is too simple, so it can't make this distinction at all. If we then go away from these to a totally different class of models called decision trees, then we're essentially writing if statements. Uh, and we can see that in the data quite straight away, right? We get what seems to be uh, kind of these, you know, you could imagine it 
as if statements. It's not linear, it's more blocky because it's saying anything in this range and this range is blue. Anything in this range and this range is red and so on. Uh, it's Here we can see it's leaving green as kind of a default. Uh, so if here red, if here blue, else green. Uh, great in some circumstances. Uh, always a good way of starting because again, if you can if you can use this, there is some logic underneath. Uh, difference between decision tree random forest. I'm not going to talk about. They are essentially peas in a pod. Very similar techniques, but there's some differences under the hood. K news neighbor. Oh, now and this one works great in this data set. So this one we're interested in. So there are many different kind of neighboring techniques um, and models. I don't really know them. I've only really used k-nearest neighbor. So here we're essentially saying for the data we have, so our training set, we're asking each data point we have, what are you? Are you class one, two, three? Are you red, green, or blue? And then we're saying, okay, where you are, plus where your next one is, let's make that entire circle, that entire zone, your color. And then you're iterating through each point doing this until, you find, until you've gone through all points. And then you can refine this in different ways and you can uh, handle conflict in different ways. But this is essentially what you do. And you try and make sure that not only is each training point in, in its right color, but also uh, you make those regions big enough to encompass as much green, as much blue, as much red as possible. And this is exactly what we're seeing here, right? We see all red points, classify as red, fine. Let's, um, let's imagine we're iterating through this. So we start with the red ones. We make the entire thing red, great. The blue ones, let's make as much blue as possible. Well, we see that these points will be fighting. So the measure we're using here is essentially the biggest circle you can make. So we're seeing the difference between these two and we're gonna cut it as much as possible in the middle between them. You're seeing my mouse, right? Otherwise it becomes a bit difficult for me to point. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, and then in these, on these sides, even though there's no points, it becomes the same thing. We're using this metric to define as best difference as possible, given what we have. Uh, and here we're using something called the Minkowski metric. You can use the Manhattan metric, which is more uh, linear based on streets. So this is great for anything that has to do with, you know, crime in an area or uh, population density or things like this, um, uh, uh, real estate value. Uh, and again, you define, do you want this as circles or do you want this as kind of street on, on top of a street map? Very versatile. For these things. Uh, and then, um, so back to our example then. And then we're doing the same thing for green. And what we're just not seeing, or maybe I'm just not seeing, is that our, gr our blue points here are actually in blue, and our green points here are actually in green. And that's why we're getting 100% accuracy. But I'm not seeing it. And I think it is because I've defined the points to be plotted bigger than they actually are. So it's a very small regions of blue and green, because again, we can make those very, very small regions blue and green. But of course that is over training. For those small regions, we are over training. So K nearest neighbor is very uh, dependent on uh, having a good sample set because otherwise you will, and we can see that here and the edges as well. It's kind of just assuming this is true which might, may or may not be the case. What would have been better, in my opinion, what would have been better, uh, what should have worked better, but doesn't of course, it is, uh, are these tree models. They make more sense because we found simple logic underneath it here and it's more future proof. Uh, will it work? Is it 100% accurate? It's not, but, we don't know what, what other data points are coming in. 
And that's kind of the trick. We have a model, it works for what we have, but what happens when the next data comes in? So, um, is there anything else we should mention on these examples? Or do you want us to, to move on and kind of wrap things up and go back to our, our lecture notes? As you might have guessed, I like talking, so I can just talk and talk. But if you have any questions about this, this would be the time. Uh, I'm not sure we'll go back to the perceptron. Again, if you have questions about it, we'll jump back. But uh, shall we move on? I'm waiting for someone to say yes or write in the chat. Thanks. Perfect. In the dust. Uh, so what we've done, uh, is that not the shortcut anymore? Uh, me, me and PowerPoint. What we've done is our first machine learning problem. Woo! Great job, everyone. Uh, in fact, we've just taken a classical problem, right? If any of you were ever working with a problem like this, you would just write an if statement, it would be done. Uh, let's see. Can you post text from slide? I added the slides to the chat in the beginning. Uh, do you want to download that? Or do you want me to explicitly post the text? While you type out, I'll just continue on. I can upload the slides again in the chat if you didn't see them. Fluity. I maybe didn't post that link. Can... Oh, right, now I get it. Here, I will add the file again. There, there. So I'm adding the, the slides again to the chat. Please let me know if you're seeing them. And then download them and you have them all there. So I'll keep on talking. Uh, can someone just write in the chat and confirm that there's a PDF lying, lying in the chat? Uh, great, thanks Jonas. Um, uh, so we've run our first machine learning program. Uh, we've, we've done machine learning for the first time, hands on, which is great. Well done, everyone. Uh, the trick here is, and I was just saying this, right? If you're ever in an industry, you write an if statement, but this is kind of the trick in these easy cases is why am I using machine learning? Why wouldn't I just write an if statement? What's the benefit here? Because most problems will kind of be this simple. Um, so when I started out uh, in uh, using this in physics, it, it was everyone was using if statements. And then somewhere in the back of my head, you know, you just have to ask, well, why not? Why at least try it? Like I have an hour to kill. Uh, and it turns out that it's better. It just works a lot better because you're removing the human part. You're removing your idea of writing if, especially physics, right? We know how physics work. Oh, it should be this, it should be this. But what about, you know, interference from the electronics? What if the values you've written down aren't correct? And these are things a machine learning algorithm just doesn't take into account. It, it doesn't care, right? There is no, there are no rules uh, because it's just going to do the EPT as we've been talking about, right? It's You've given me this data. You've told. You've given me a training set. You've told me that these. This is the classes. These are the classes. I'm going to fix it. You've told me this is how accurate I am. Sure. Here is how you do it. No logic. No thinking. No thinking might be an overstatement, but you get the. You get the gist. And uh, in 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 our case, it worked a lot better. And if this is the case, fine. You're done. Use machine learning. If it's too complex, if there's too much data, so the big data field, use machine learning because you just can't handle it otherwise. Uh, if 
it needs to be future proof. So you know that this data may or may not be a subset of what it's going to look like in a few years. Use machine learning. But on the other hand, do I have the infrastructure, right? Can I quickly write this up on, on Google Colab? Can I, do I have a GPU? Do I, do I really need the accuracy? What am I doing? These are the things you have to balance against each other. And a lot of people have a very difficult time doing this, not just as I was talking about before in the, in the hype, not just understanding where to use this and, and getting this out to the user, but actually, is it worth it? Will it be worth it? Um, the, the flip side also, of course, is we're getting new things, right? If I wanted to have self-driving cars 60 years ago, I would have to write if statements. Uh, sorry, I was just looking out here thinking, you know, can I, how would I count people passing by? Well, if you're in a system where you can't change anything, sure, video recognition or facial recognition or image recognition, perfect. But you could just also add a sensor uh, that measures footprints or something. So there's, it's not, uh, it's not a solve at all. It's not, you know, a magical tool. Uh, it's not Harry Potter, as I showed before, right? It's just another tool in our toolbox. It's essentially another piece of code. Uh, and I hope that's what you've gotten from this, that there's there's nothing super cool or super magical. That'll come later. We're going to uh, we'll jump into TensorFlow a bit, and we're going to do a really cool example, which I don't know, maybe I could have done classically just using if statements and normal code. I'm really not sure. I'm not that great at image processing. Um, well, now now I'm okay, at least. Uh, any questions on that? I think that was a good summary. Or did anything else pop into your head? Uh, if you feel down in the dumps, like, oh, is this everything? Then, yeah, that's good. That's what I want you to feel like. But that's definitely not uh, the truth. And we're going to fix that in the remaining time that we have. Everything crystal clear? No questions? Great. So, TensorFlow. Whew. Let's, let's focus more on the problems and less on the code, is essentially what we're doing. We're moving up one abstraction level. This means right now we can start doing cooler things, uh, more difficult things, without really having to tinker uh, underneath. Uh, there are Great, uh, there are great tools for reading into this. Um, I think what I want to do is I'll leave you these links. Um, did I have this? I'll just jump back to the schedule quickly. So this was the schedule I posted in the beginning. So I think what we're going to do now is I'm just going to quickly give you an introduction to TensorFlow, show you some examples. And then actually, I think I'm a bit quicker than I thought I would be. So maybe we'll take a slightly longer dinner break and I'll leave you a bit more to read into this because when we come back, uh, we're going to properly uh, jump into a, a, an example that I have. You can look at this before if you want and, and write down questions, that's fine. Um, so TensorFlow, and I think I opened those links here. Uh, Yes, one of, let me just see here. One of the things we have here is a playground. Uh, I thought I had that open already. Where, uh, and you can just Google this, I can even point this, put this in the chat, where we're now doing essentially the same thing, but we've moved away from single perceptron which is what we have if we do this, uh, to deep learning. So we now have several perceptrons that we're putting either after each other or in parallel to each other. Uh, and we're trying to handle complex data. Uh, so this playground, you know, I think is a good way of getting into things. It's again, not it's showing things visually, but nothing visual is actually happening. It's just normal data, x1 and x2, two variables. And we're using a perceptron to try and identify the data. 
Can anyone tell me why this is not working? Why we're stuck? Again, we're back to our perceptron. This is exactly what we're doing in, in our last example. That's actually why we used perceptron, because they're essentially a neuron. Central point. Uh, not cent Central point is a good guess, but that's not here. Uh, the model not being complex enough is definitely true. Uh, I, you can see um, neurons or perceptrons, if you just do the math, right? There's a multiplication. You cannot, one way of putting it is, there's no way of squaring using multiplication unless with itself, but that you don't have. Uh, another way of saying is precisely what uh, is written in the chat here by Theo, uh, is there's no way of separating two circles with one line, with a straight line, I should say. We can change the data set, done. Simple, this is exactly what we're doing, right? This is our iris example. Circle, we can change the data. Give us x1 squared, x2 squared, done. If we don't do that, well, as I was mentioning previously, right? What if we change the data? Can we add a perceptron beforehand? This should work. I'm sorry. We can see that it will. Okay, instead of waiting X number of trading, this will eventually work. But let me just cheat and make it a bit quicker. Uh, again, you should always do things live. That is the, the key, right? There we go. So I've added enough complexity now to the model. And I've added, as you can see, and here is the best part. You can see how we're processing the data for the classification. So x1, x2. Is just are just the coordinates. The first perceptron layer will return back the data modified in some way. As you can see here, right? It's sl sl one line, another line, another line. This is combined so that uh, our second layer here sees a perfect circle and a line and combined again to give the results. So actually, as I was showing before, right, this is all we need. There we go. I know I've done this. Um, it doesn't need, again, never do things live. I, I apologize for that. So we're not going to do much more than add several perceptrons in parallel and um, after each other. And this is giving us our neural network. This is giving us the extra complexity we need. Again, now I'm just playing around. And this is what I encourage you to do. Play around a bit, get a feel for this. Why is this not working? Well, I added more layers. Well, why does it help if I add more width? Read a bit of the documentation. Uh, and then I think after dinner, we'll jump into our example. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk too much about neural networks. I'll do that as well when we get back. Um, do you agree? Is this a good time to take a break? And then maybe we'll extend it a bit. We'll take an hour, 20 minutes. Uh, is that okay with everyone? I know at least I'm hungry. My stomach's been grumbling a bit. Great. Uh, I will probably turn off my camera, but I'll leave the screen on. Uh, I posted the link. Yeah. Uh, I posted one link. Uh, you have the slides, but I will post these as well. Great. Oh, sorry. Great documentation uh, regarding the <laughs> control C is not working because I'm copying the wrong thing. Uh, Great documentation regarding this from Google and from TensorFlow's official page. Uh, but uh, as I said, I'll turn off my camera. Uh, I'll leave everything else up. Um, 
and if you need to just write in the chat and I'll look at it from time to time uh, should we say seven o'clock sharp I might be here a few minutes before but that's a good time great see you in a, a few minutes or in a while have a great dinner Uh, I think we'll just jump into it. Uh, so what we've got left is getting into TensorFlow, which I hope you've read a bit of the documentation I sent. Um, otherwise, I'll just show that off a bit and we'll dive into it. There's a lot to do, but I've got one big example uh, that hopefully will, will give us everything we need. Uh, and to get there, I think I'm going to explain ever so briefly the concept of neural network, uh, ne neural networks, why we use them, and go, be go back a bit to our playground that we were doing before dinner uh, a bit more properly. Did everyone have a good dinner, by the way? 
again, in, a, in the best of worlds, we'd be eating some very nice pizza or something in uh, a freeze Gothenburg office. Uh, so what we did before with Perceptron and things, uh, that was based, uh, so Perceptron actually is from the 60s, it's a very old idea, based on the idea, not that we technically had a challenge, but more practically, uh, we didn't want to write down everything. We didn't want to write huge if statements. We didn't want to be locked uh, if the data changes, if the circumstances change. We want something that can learn and we want it now. And so tech and technically, you know, computers back then weren't that great. So you couldn't do much. Um, and that's why it looks very simple. That's why it is very simple with our eyes today. But practically, um, they weren't thinking too much about the technology, trying to make it easy, or you know that that came much later. Neural networks, kind of, again, with our eyes today, look very similar. Practically, are very different, and technically, are very different. Uh, so bear that in mind when we when we jump into this. So the whole idea of neural networks is that well our, our brains work, don't they? And we're trying to essentially solve problems that are easy for humans but difficult for computers. So why can't we just copy neurons? I mean, our brain has a couple of million, if not billions. That would work. And that is exactly what's done. So I've got an I'm sorry, should have presenter mode on. Uh, so what we have here in the top is a human neuron. This is what it looks like. And we're essentially just trying to copy it with an artificial neuron. Uh, in a very similar sense to what the perceptron was doing, we take uh, an input, and this is a big vector with, uh, with loads of numbers, uh, could be a matrix, could be uh, any image, for instance, we have an activation function, and this is what we learn. Essentially, instead of outputting some number, which the perceptron did, we're only going to output one or zero. We're only going to ask a binary question. Uh, and that's what we put out, one or zero for and again, you can configure this so either it's for each input or for the inputs combined or things like this, depending on how you want to choose your input. So if we then go to the playground with this in mind, we have two inputs, you know, and now we're not doing anything, so they're just going to plot themselves. We're now adding a neuron that takes x1, x2 and outputs one or zero. Now, or in this case, minus one or one. Uh, sorry, it, that convention differs, but it, it's a binary answer, right? There is, it looks to be white here, but there is no gradient. It is minus one or one. I think if I do that, that's even even easier. It has uh, some built-in thing to make the visualization look better. There is no gradient. Uh, if I add two in parallel, it's the same thing, but these two are just outputting zero or one, or sorry, minus one or one. And then it's being combined here at the end. That's where you get the, uh, the, the gradient from. And that's it. There's no nothing complex. We're not doing anything smart. And we can only really use it for binary problems unless we tinker around with that. Bit. But this is how our brain works. I mean, we just add many, many neurons. Uh, and we have a human brain. And again, this is not even close to even a mouse or a cockroach, but that is the principle. Um, and do I have that here? Maybe I didn't, pr uh, maybe I didn't show that here. Sorry, I thought I had the link, but I couldn't find it now. I'll find it later. Um, there are, uh, there are online tools where you get images and you show exactly the same thing as here. So slightly more complex. I thought I added that, but I can't. What is it, this one?
No. So on on this slide, I've added very good links. I think it was maybe this one. Again, sorry, I should have prepared. It was this one. Uh, I've added links where you can play around a bit more with this. And again, it's not really trying to learn or understand. It's more just to get a feeling for it. So this is a neural network that's running in the background. It's the MNIST problem, very classical problem, where it's looking at numbers, so handwritten digits, and then it's uh, actively trying to understand, okay, what number am I looking at? So now you're wondering, well, it's a neural network, right? How can it handle one to 10? It's a binary problem. Well, there are ways around it. And if you read into it, and I would recommend you do, you can get you can get this out. Uh, essentially, what you do is you add 10 neurons at the end here, and then you ne never combine the output. And then essentially, you're saying it's at number one if the first neuron activates, and so on. Uh, so play around with that. That would be my recommendation. Uh, you then have Kaggle, uh, which did I link to that? No, I did not. Uh, Kaggle, uh, I'll write that in the chat, which is a big online uh, forum, let's say, where you have your Jupyter Notebook and loads of examples and loads of code and people put up examples uh, of how to write code for those different examples. So that is, you, you know, essentially everything you'd ever need to know. And then you can get into different uh, architectures. So how you put loads of these neurons together uh, and create different architectures for what you need. And, you know, I'm, uh, maybe I'm overwhelming you. We're not going to talk about all this, but this is the breakthrough. Going to a very simple box, this neuron, that opens up everything. That is the key to modern machine learning uh, and deep learning, I should say, because now we're adding things in levels um, and we're we're literally throwing computing power at our problem. We're not, and, and this was what I was talking about before, right? With how data can be very dirty, how uh, good data matters more than a, a, a big network and so on. And this is what people are doing, is they're just throwing data at the neural network. Um, if we go back here to our, to our first playground, right? Uh, we have x1 and x2, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to classify two circles on top of each other. Okay, yeah, we have, might not look like much, but a quite complex network. Whereas we could just ch uh, change the input values that we're looking at and we're done. On the other hand, uh, what this represents is, you know, I went out with my camera and took images on the road. I didn't have to worry about uh, catching a sign signpost or anything. It just works. It finds whatever uh, data is in that image, essentially, and uses that for classification. It requires more data points. It requires a more complex network, but it works. It doesn't need my input. And again, if things change, it, uh, it all handles this automatically without any cleanup, without any anything like that. Um, so great. Welcome to, to today. You're, you're finally, hopefully, up to scratch with, with very basic machine learning to what is kind of the base for everything today. Um, now we just have to have to get there. And instead of saying you're done, it's more like it's just begun. Uh, there is so much to dig into. What I've prepared for us is a very nice example. And it, it is really not just applicable, but actually very relevant and quite difficult. And I'm not sure it can be done uh, hands-on, uh, um, classical. So let's see if this is the one. Uh, no, this is the first one we can do. Uh, I added this as an example if you're interested in properly understanding neural networks. So it's the, the first link here, 
that's part of my GitHub. Uh, where you're using TensorFlow for the first time and you're adding in a model, you're trying to get it to fit a straight line and it doesn't work properly. And you try and understand everything around that. Uh, we can do that. We can take a, a vote or we can jump into and TensorFlow has loads of great examples themselves. And this one is, uh, oh, now I forgot who is based on, is Salando. So it's clothing identification, which is just very similar to the number identification that we talked about, but I find it a bit more fun and a bit more relevant. Um, so what do you say? Do you want to do the very basic thing where we get a hands-on feeling for neurons first, or do you want to jump into the clothing example? Just write in the chat. Clothing, great. Uh, I think what I'll do uh, as in last time, right? I will probably, I gave you this link. Uh, you just press run in Google Colab. I think it's so well documented that I might just leave you to it. And you can just ask me if there are any questions. Uh, we're only 13, we lost a few uh, during dinner. If you want, please just uh, unmute your microphone and let's chat for a bit as well. It's nice hearing your thoughts, uh, especially now that we're getting into something more complex. Um, we, the biggest change now is we're going into TensorFlow is we've done another import, uh, but the code will look very similar. Uh, we are input, importing a, a data set and we're looking for the data set for a bit. But maybe I'll, I'll scroll through here. If you have questions, please shout out or type in the chat. And we'll get, uh, when we've gone through it a bit, uh, of course, I'll be talking throughout most of it. And then we'll try and evaluate what we've been doing and what, uh, what's actually happening in the background. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Great, thanks. And going back to the question we had before, I don't think you need to change runtime. I wonder if it will be quicker with GPU or TFU, maybe. So I don't, not sure if I made that clear, but practically the difference between images and tabular data, single values are essentially just changing the size of the vector you're putting in. In many applications, what you do is you flatten the data as it comes in. So instead of giving it the actual matrix, it's, uh, uh, unless that's clear to everyone, every image you see is a matrix or a tensor maybe. Uh, so what you, you sometimes do is you take that entire image of pixel, uh, matrix of pixels and you just take line by line and produce a huge vector and then feed that to the network. Uh, why do you do this? Because in the beginning, vectors were all that you handled. Um, pretty sure that is done here, if I remember. Yeah, they do a flatten here. In Keras, so they take a 28 by 28 image, they flatten it to one big vector of 28 times 28 the length, and then feed that to the network. Uh, but uh, what this is, but how this is done is it looks like the image is being fed to the network. The network then, as its first step, transforms the image into a vector. Uh, technically or practically? 
so for your question there, how how I set how do I set the training testing training data ratio? Do you mean technically where it's set or practically? In this example, uh, it is set. Uh, do, 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 do. I know I just saw it. So in this example, it's already done in this load data. So they've already set it as uh, 60,000 to train and 10,000 to evaluate. Which for me is odd. Usually load data just throws out the data. Uh, if we check the documentation, perhaps there is a way of getting it out without this uh, pre division. Let's see this. They did Keras data set there. So what I would do is I would Google Keras data sets. That tends to be, yeah, for this, it, it seems to be right. Uh, yeah, even the data that says so. So they've already split it for us, which is very odd, actually. I did not remember that. Uh, usually what you do, um, in in a, the golden rule, when you try and divide a, a training set yourself, is that uh, you want as many as possible in the training set, uh, but the test set still has to represent the training set and vice versa. So depending on how many variables you have, how varying the data is, uh, that's kind of what you have to take into account. Inner layer, uh, let's see, you are talking about these, right? Yep, uh, so input shape, that is of course chosen by the, the images themselves. Why this 128 is chosen? Uh, 128, there is no reason for. It could be anything. You could double that, you could half that. Uh, I think they've chosen that from trial and error. Uh, the 10 at the end, that is just what I was talking about uh, before, right? We have 10 classes, so we want 10 neurons at the end. Mm. Why 128? Yeah. Uh, the way they've done this network essentially is it's something like this where you have, I can't reproduce here, but 10 at the end and 128 as the first layer. Uh, you know, you could go, you could go somewhere between zero and, or sorry, one and 784, I guess. You're going to get in 784 input values. Mm, sorry, 128 neurons. But if only one layer, what if? If you want to use two layers, you just do this. Copy, paste, and it's done. Uh, it's recommended that you never. I think that's a tech, uh, a practical recommendation, that you never have the same number of neurons uh, in each in that. Uh, let me rephrase that. It's recommended that you decrease number of neurons for each layer. So at least 127 there. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That is a practical question more than a technical. Uh, I would say for this problem, uh, I, with my experience for this problem, it doesn't make sense to have 128 neurons and one layer. It would make much more sense to have two layers and fewer neurons. But that's from experience because 
the deeper you make it, the more complexity it can handle. The wider you make it, it's more filtering than complexity. However, they know their data set, so they've chosen 128 and uh, a, a thin network, let's say. Uh, so obviously they've tested around and seen what works the best for them. Uh, and that would again say that it's not too complex. We just need to find uh, the importance. So it's, you could essentially say that you're looking for 128 pixels in these 784 that will be interesting to activate on depending on what, what clothing you have. Uh, how this is done uh, in practice when you have images is you would use something called a convolutional network. Uh, and then instead of what we've done now, where it's essentially multiplication, uh, use co something called well, convolution, uh, which is a different mathematical operator. Uh, practically what it means is you can select areas of pixels to use. Uh, and that would make this a bit, well, actually it makes it a lot more difficult to understand practically, but it, it means your network can identify interesting pixels. And uh, so you can decrease complexity rather quickly and in a more, in a more, um, in a more generic way. Here, you're directly decreasing from, you can think of it as decreasing from 784 pixels to 128 pixels. And then from those, choosing 10 classes. Did I just change my mind halfway through my sentence? Maybe I did. Yeah. Maybe I did, yeah. So what, what I'm saying here is we have, uh, we have images coming in, 784 pixels. We're then choosing a network that has a first layer of 128, that's a yeah, actually, that makes sense. In, in this case, it's very easy. In, in this case, we're saying there are 128 pixels that are interesting to us. And find them somehow. Or dec decrease these 708. Ah, sorry. Now now I know why, where my brain's going wrong. We don't remove pixels. You do that in a conv convolutional neural network. You remove stuff. Here, you're combining stuff. So you're saying, I want to decrease the 784 pixels to 128 essentially pixels, right? That's how many neurons, how many outputs you're gonna get from that level. And then you're decreasing them to 10. Uh, and that does that makes sense if you have big images that don't say much, which makes sense here. But in practice, you'd want to add more complex, you would want to add room for more complexity. So you'd want to add more layers. Did that make sense? Maybe, maybe if you ask a, a, a follow-up question, we can make sense of this. Oh yeah, for this uh, task exactly, uh, it's understandable. But yeah. uh, if, for example, I want to have uh, not ten but uh, one hundred uh, different classes, um, so would it uh, help to add uh, additional layers or additional amount of neurons? For that question, if, if that's your question exactly, then no. Uh -huh. It's more to do with how, how much difference there is in your data. Uh, if uh, we would imagine that uh, I have uh, exactly the same pictures, but like more stuff. A hundred class, yeah. yeah. Then probably not. Uh -huh. Then probably you would not need more. Again, I'm just I'm just guessing here, right? But probably this would be fine, because the complexity it's not that complex. They are very different. Uh huh. And uh, what about uh, like other tasks? Uh, uh, is it exist some like rule how much uh, neurons, how much layers I have to use? No, I don't even think there's a golden rule for this. Uh -huh. uh, it's it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, so you you would. Like if, the, if, if this was my task for the first time, 
uh, first of all, you wouldn't use this anymore. You would use a convolutional neural network, and that makes it slightly easier. But if this was what you had in front of you, you would start off simple. You would try and divide by 10. So your first level here would be 78 neurons, say. And then you would maybe half that. And then you would add, you would start with quite a complex network and you would train that and see if you get something. Um, some people might do the opposite, start with a very simple network and train that. It depends on you know what computer you have and how much time you have. Uh, or you would do both at the same time and see what performance you have, just to first understand, you know, can we solve this problem? Um, but no, there's no, as far as I know, there's no golden rule for this. It's more try it and then base it on other things around you. So uh, there are uh, there are kind of set networks that do special things and are very widely used. So there's one called YOLO, uh, fun name for that matter, which is perfect for fast image recognition. And you can look at how big that is and the architecture of that and you can see, okay, I'm kind of doing a similar thing. Maybe I should use a similar architecture. Maybe I can use that straight off, just retrain it. Uh, or maybe I'm doing something much smaller. Maybe I can at least look at that architecture and try and copy it with the rules that, well, you, you want to end up with 100 neurons at the end. You start off with, say, 700, and you want to decrease for each layer you go through. And then you just build around that and see how well you're doing and see, okay, can I speed it up? So it's a very iterative process. I hope that answered your question. Uh, yeah, uh, but I have uh, one more. <laughs> mm. uh, Please, it, more questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, is it uh, dependent somehow on how much data I have? No. Like, uh, if I have, uh, for example, uh, 10,000 mm. or 10 millions? Yes. Uh, so it, it's all intertwined, right? You remember what we were talking about with overfitting and underfitting? Yeah. So if you don't have enough data, you cannot make the model too complex. Uh, essentially, um, in this example, it's still easy, right? Each neuron essentially is one variable. So you need at least one one data point for each variable that you add. So we have 128 times 10, so 1,280. We have 10 times the amount of data. We're fine in this example. But that's maybe not always the case. And then maybe you have to have, have an, a, a, a simpler network. The same thing here. If we add another net, well, technically, we have to then multiply these three together to get a reasonable set of data. And again, but this is not, you know, a golden rule. You don't have to have this much data, but it's a, a good estimate. And if I'm multiplying these three together, we don't have enough data. Okay, maybe I don't need to add another another layer. Maybe it becomes too complex. I hope well, that made sense. Yeah. Uh, and what about uh, using different activation functions? Oh, good, great question. Uh, so if you played around here, um, there are a few to avoid. Uh, so Rel, um, do you know what these look like or should I try and find them on Google? Uh, I, I'm not sure that I remember it, <laughs> all, all these. Okay, so Rel, Relu uh, is uh, Modulus X, I think. So it's, yeah, it's zero and then one, or, and then linear. Uh, is this good? Uh, absolutely. The only problem is how do you handle the derivative at zero? And why would I ask about the derivative? Because it's the derivative, or we call it the gradient to generalize, that we use to improve our model. Uh, and usually, our, close to zero, we want it to be linear, we want it to be nice. So this is an old activation function. This was used uh, uh, in the beginning because it's easy, 
but now we realize it, it adds numerical complexity. Uh, tan hyperbolic, hyperbolic tangent function. Uh, that's probably the best one without the, for this one, with the lines. Uh, we don't have that problem. We have the problem instead at very high uh, values of x. Well, we're never there, so it's fine. Uh, you can use essentially anything. Sigmoid uh, is very similar to ReLU. Uh, and again, we have a very nice slope, well-defined uh, derivative. Um, and that's what you're looking for. But then is one better than the other? Not really. In, in my experience, it's always numerical issues that you face. And it's only going for the very old ones compared to the newer ones. Maybe slightly faster, but not, not what I've come across. I hope that answered your question. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. So if you have a chance, either now or later on, uh, let's see if this, oh yeah, of course, this is, uh, so one of the links I added is facial recognition, that's why it's not, or image recognition using webcam, that's why it's not working for me, because I'm using my webcam already. It was the the Java one. Um, but I would recommend you go through these uh, when you have a chance, uh, because again, it gives you a good understanding of what's happening and you're looking through it. Uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, a question, what about choosing optimization algorithm? Ooh. Uh, it's the guidelines tend to be problem specific. Uh, so, in image recognition, Adams uh, seems to be the best. Uh, can I answer why? I don't remember. I'm not even actually sure I've ever heard why more than experience. Uh, gradient descent is what you always use when you're explaining uh, ML because it's it's simple but it runs into problems. Um, and there are a few others, like there's, um, it's called entropy loss something, which works again very well for images. Uh, essentially, it all depends on how fast you want to, your model to improve and what's actually interesting um, in the initial step. I think after a few, thousand iterations it doesn't matter too much but like if you wanted to use gradient descent for image classification it's going to be crazy because uh, pixels are not correlated and the differences um, between images become minuscule and you you're not going to improve quickly enough um, it's kind of the the general gist of what I was taught Don't know if that answered your question. Uh, maybe I should just add the, the practicality of if you're in a field, you know which one to use. Like you, uh, for medical images, we use Adams. Uh, you can always try another one and see what happens. And you can always try all of them together. So there, there, machine learning becomes very theoretical, but also very empirical you try and see what works uh, which is the good thing and the terrible thing about it it's not like pure maths where we know exactly what to do at all times uh, this actually reminds me of when i was at university to reading a course and i think it's called automatic control which i guess was my first introduction to kind of machine learning and i got so annoyed because you had to 
choose coefficients for I think it was a water pump we were kind of controlling two tanks and um, water was always running and you had to kind of make sure they had stayed level uh, and they say oh you know choose this value to be free and this one to be a multiple of pi and it works oh why does it work uh, it just does <laughs> And here I was, you know, hard mathematical background, a bit of physics, and you're sitting there like, but, but why? Uh, and I think after a while, you have to go back to your problem solving. I don't know if you're engineers or what your backgrounds are, but you have to put that in your mind. Like you're just solving a problem. Uh, as long as it works, it's fine. And as long as you can kind of start somewhere, it makes you happy. Uh, in all of this, so especially on optimizations, actually, it also has to do with um, the mathematical side is, are you going to be able to find uh, global minima uh, in your problem or have you defined, uh, are you using the wrong optimizer? So gradient descent does not guarantee global minima. I don't even think it guarantees local minima depending on the problem. So there's a lot of things to take in, but uh, usually it's answered by, yeah, try this, it works. Yeah. Um, I think that was just what I was getting to, right? Uh, depending on the problem, um, depending on the problem space, you you might not have uh, enough momentum in your descent. Uh, but that also goes back to what I was saying about pixel correlation. It, it, it's all about moving in this optimization space. And then let's not forget the most important thing, we're still on a computer. Uh, so uh, there is no small numbers. There are no small numbers, right? They're handled as floats or double floats or uh, whichever language you're in. Eventually, if the difference is small enough, right, you're going to lose it in numerical errors. Which I think is the problem with entropy or can be. FCN. What is? Oh, oh, oh. For image recognition, would you ever use a fully connected? Yeah, we had to use uh, FCN in order to do semantic segmentation. We saw that it was kind of better by huh. doing that. That is really cool. So. My that, my generic answer, the answer I would go for is, you always use CNN uh, if the image can, if you're not using the whole image. CNN gives you a way of throwing away information. Um, but then after that, you can use whatever you want. Did you, so what images were you get presented with uh, that you solved using an FCN? We used an MNIST. Like uh, for training, we used an MNIST set, but then we were testing it on a, a much bigger picture, like with different images, like digits. Well, that could work, right? It's, I think complexity, I think you might have made a very complex net, whereas CNN might have been easier. But as you say, right, you might have, you got better results, which again makes sense. But MNIST can be solved with a very basic uh, CNN to like 98% accuracy or something. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I think the FCN that you mean fully connected is the fully connected layer, right? I mean, in the CNN, you have the convolution layer and then in the end, it's going to be the fully connected layer. That I think that is what Varun said, that it's uh, fully connected. but it might not be FCN, but it is CNN with fully connected layer. 
Okay, thanks. Not sure about that, but yeah. Yeah, no, so what what I'm see what I'm seeing in front of me is either uh you know a, a full net of neurons, which is the fully connected, right? Or you add in a, uh, a convolution part. Is that the right way of thinking about it? Yeah, and then I would say CNN makes it for, so for MNIST, they are, let's see if we can get a few examples, right? So the images are quite clean cut. There's not much to throw away. Uh, that makes it reasonable to use F uh, FCN, right? And it will get very good results, but it's quite a complicated network, whereas CNN would allow you to throw away quite a bit and still do uh, um, classification and you might get an easier network. But I'm thinking more, when I, when I think image analysis and I think, what should I use? I'm thinking more, let's see if we can get a quick example. Even these are quite clean. I'm thinking something like this, where I need some way for my network to throw away everything but this part, and that I can only do with a CNN. So convolution gives me a way of, uh, of essentially throwing away parts. I don't do any mathematical operation. I just find, um, and, and, and uh, without adding all details, CNN does not just always pick this part of the image, but it, it finds what in an image is more impress uh, important. So in this image, it would be the stop sign, for instance, which is located here in another image, the stop sign might be here and it would choose that. Uh, and you cannot get that in any other way apart from having a convolutional part, as far as I know, and today. I have to add that and you never know what's going to happen. But good question. Uh, now, now we're getting some some interesting thoughts. So to 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 fully explain that a bit more, so uh, on the neural networks we've talked about will take all. Oh, thank you. Fully convolutional. Then I get you. Um. Well, that changes that a bit, but but sorry, my, uh, what I was saying there is, uh, what we're doing right now is we have n neurons, we just have neurons, right? We have no convolutional part, we have no none of this fancy stuff. That means that we're mathematically defining how to handle every pixel. And if they were multiplying it by zero or not, uh, that doesn't matter too much, but we're handling every image in the same way. Uh, what a convolutional neural network does, or a convolutional part in a neural network does, allows you to, in the image, pick out, say, 30 pixels, and they're not in the same place for each image, but you're giving it rules of how to find those 30 pixels. And if it's a, if it's a black and white image, maybe you're finding the most white parts, so the most clo close to one, uh, zero parts. Close to one? It depends on the encoding. Um, and then you've you've changed the problem for from you know an image of 100 times 100 pixels to 30 times 30, uh, and then you can start start over, and uh, you can also do convolution with some added things so the image isn't actually a part but it's a part and then a mathematical operation, but you're really throwing away everything outside that interesting part. Whereas here you're choosing every pixel and then you're multiplying every pixel with some value. Yeah. Don't know if I made the difference clear. It's subtle, but it's there. Essentially, it's adding some ability to what to pick out of the image.
more questions. How's the example going? Are you running through it? Have you, can you kind of figure out what's happening? Okay, uh, I'll, if there are no questions, I'll ask one myself. Why is loss and accuracy? Why do they not add up to one? You might ask, why, why would I think they add up to one? Well, isn't the opposite of accuracy loss? Sorry, the question again was, uh, so when I'm, when I'm fitting my model, I get a loss value and an accuracy. Uh, what do we mean by accuracy? What do we mean by loss? And why do these not add up to one? Uh, so one answer is, isn't loss a cost parameter? Uh, what do you mean by cost? Uh, like obtain through the cost function from, uh comparing the actual output versus the trained input. What would that accuracy be then? Uh, like overall accuracy on how much it was able to recognize as positive per epoch. Okay. I think you're right about lost. So loss depends on the cost function. But accuracy, how can I know the accuracy when I've only given it the train? Oh, sorry, yeah. And accuracy then is how well the trained images fit the trained labels, exactly. Sorry, I, I misinterpreted what you said. But that is precisely right. So these have nothing to do with each other. And loss, should loss necessarily go down? Is that a good thing? No. Right? This is where you have to keep your head. It depends on the optimizer. It doesn't have to be, it has to change, but it's not sure that your optimizer wants loss to go down. Maybe it wants loss to go up but accuracy should always go up. Uh, now, when, the, when I said that as well, I've not come across any optimizer where loss uh, goes up, but I think entropy is defined backwards, where in general, you want entropy to be as high as possible, uh, but it will come out as just like this, and it will go down. Um, has everyone had a chance to run through the example? Or are you still running for? And are we only, what are we? Are we only six active or are we more? Twelve. Uh, yeah, I know we're twelve connected, but I'm not hearing everyone or not everyone's writing in the chat. Maybe you're all there. You're just a bit shy. But uh, sorry, has everyone had a chance to run through it or are you still running through it? That was my main question. Uh, yeah. We ran through it once. Great. Were there any questions? Hopefully it is quite clear. Um, we can go in. Again, right. The, uh, 
if you just run through it, it everything's very simple but we can play around a bit and we can see what happens um where would we play around um let's see this is all making predictions this is the accuracy so one way one thing to play around with is train this for 20 epochs so essentially uh, what we're doing now is we're doubling the amount of time it has to look at the data we're trying to uh, not only find a local minimum but with this um, optimizer which is Adam it will jump so sometimes uh, an epoch will be worse as you can see now we're just going up sometimes an epoch will be worse and then you in your code have to change so that you're actually only saving the best uh, model result but here it's just keeps going up um, you all also quite often write in your code you know n not run for 100 epochs but run until the last five epochs are not improving anymore or something like that uh, depending on complexity and things it could be five it could be 50 and so on because then you've uh, you've potentially reached then uh, a maxima or minima you're not coming out of so here we ran through it i improved from 0 0.93 to 0 0.94 which is not bad uh, but uh, testing accuracy and accuracy is the same so this is where you would check check for over and underfitting if these two differ uh, something is very wrong and now i'm just gonna jump through all these uh, and let's see did anything change so what i like is it will show not just the correct ones but i also show the incorrect ones and my favorite thing is depending on how well trained the model is you either how for how many epochs you've trained the model what usually happens is you go from a model that is quite uncertain so a few you've trained it for a bit and it's quite inaccurate but it usually has kind of the right answer it just chooses the wrong one so we can look at this one for instance it knows it could be a t-shirt as well right which was number six no it, it knows it could be a shirt which is number six but it's going for a t-shirt at top which visually as a human uh, that makes sense right you could mistake those uh, heck on that image i'm mistaking that that looks like a, a hoodie uh, and sandals and sneakers are very similar but most humans, I guess, would go for even that sandal and think, oh, it could be a shoe, a sneaker as well. Um, and this is one of these kind of interesting problems, especially uh, for me in the medical field, is, okay, you've, you've, you've wrote down your, uh, how to define accuracy. You've got your model for that. You're training your model. Your model is very accurate but when it's incorrect is it better to be fully incorrect or is it better to be a bit unsure so, so would it have been better here to say shoe sneaker but also maybe uh, sorry sandal but also maybe sneaker or like we had for this one uh, again i'm um, this was today we're kind of jumping into Tesla a bit so it's worth pointing out these these differences as well that we have to remember the application in, uh, in mind and we have to remember the user uh, we have to have the application and user in mind what are we actually doing what is the goal here if it is uh, I think I have that for Floaty if we jump into that at the beginning it's missing some people right and it's jumping out of people but does that matter is that the point do i need everyone right now or uh, do i have some time to decide right am i for instance here am i 
just trying to get a grasp of how many people there are, or am I trying to do facial recognition, for instance, on everyone? Um, and that matters a lot when you're looking at how well does my, uh, my model perform, and also how well does it have to perform? Uh, you might not always want your model to be as accurate as possible, because your accuracy measure might not be what's the most interesting. Uh, and that makes it quite difficult. Um, so let's see, if you don't have questions, uh, I'll try and figure out a few good good pointers that, that I hope you've taken from this. Uh, do you feel confident you could run your own, you could write your own machine learning algorithm given some data sets? Uh, essentially not from scratch, but could you, if I gave you MNIST, so numbers, could you put that into here and, and follow it through? Do you feel confident about that? Yeah. Awesome. Then, then I've done a good job. Uh, that could be a, a good follow-up from this. Uh, it's essentially change uh, these lines. MNIST exists in Keras, so it should be quite easy. And I, it probably does this as well. Uh, the second thing, do you understand what the model looks like code-wise? Like how, how this all fits together. What, what is the model? Or how do I, if, I, if I've now, so given what we, let me rephrase that, given what we've done here, right? Uh, we've, we know the input is images. Uh, what would you have to do to export this model to me or to your um, webcam that's connected to a Raspberry Pi or something? Do you have to retrain on your Raspberry Pi? If I have the weight matrix, I don't think I need to, if I have the right kind of test images. Uh, oof. See, I like those answers. That is a great answer, uh, but it's not that bad anymore. Uh, at the very, very, very end here, when you're using the model, um, there is actually, I think they call it probability model. Yeah, the, there is actually an object that is the model itself. And you can save that as a, a file. Uh, these are the things I don't do that often. But it is a, 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 a an object that you save to file or send. Uh, you only need to. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm seeing the chat here. This is how you call it. So in this, it's called probability model, and we can just go up and see that it was defined here. Uh, and let's see. Uh, so we save that. We send it over to our Raspberry Pi. It just needs the libraries so we can run this. Uh, now I, I, I feel a bit stupid. I, me I mentioned webcam. So the very important thing, uh, and that's a field in itself, is if you change anything from your setup, your model is not going to work. And this is called, um, oh, there is a great word for it and I've forgotten it. So the solution is called transfer learning, but the problem is called, uh, um, oh, never mind. But essentially, if you change anything, so you change webcam or you're training it, um, uh, I should say, hardware doesn't matter, right? If it's run on your GPU or if it's on any NVIDIA GPU, that's all handled by TensorFlow. Any CPU handled by TensorFlow, that's, <clears throat> that's fine, as long as you get in the TensorFlow libraries. Uh, but if you change, for instance, uh, your webcam, uh, if it's images, if you change your um, mouse, if you're doing ma uh, mouse inputs, things like that, then you will have to retrain your model because it's based on this. And there's always something uh, in there in the background, which of course you can handle by changing the webcam itself. Uh, but images have small artifacts in them, which the model can sometimes pick up 
and it's very hard to test for these unless of course you you expand your sets to have images from other cameras and things uh, another problem from healthcare where we have multiple x-ray machines and things and we try to somehow have one model that can handle all of these uh, not the easiest thing um, uh, when you transfer models from one image from one set to another the problem is called transfer learning uh, and there's a lot to read about this uh, usually what you do is you retrain part of the model so usually the input you would have three parts in the model an input part which has a huge neural network or several in an architecture a middle part again huge architecture and an output part and you would usually change the input part and retrain it to handle your input data but you would let, uh, let the rest be the same um, okay so now we know how to move our model now I, I chatted a lot about how the models can be in, uh, unstable. Um, but yeah, do we have any idea? So now that we've trained our model, right, on clothing, what happens now if we throw in MNIST into this exact model? How, do we have any idea how it will behave? Let's see if there's someone in the chat. Like it, accuracy would be low? Um, well, let's see. I, I guess that's true, uh, but also false. Uh, the answer I'm actually looking for is we don't know. We have no idea. If you haven't trained it or tested it, you actually don't know what's going to happen. So if you remember, uh, oh, do I still have that up? Yes. If you remember here, our initial iris. So this is why um, I hope you 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 will appreciate it as much as me. This is why I started with this. Everything falls back to the simple examples. So in this initial iris, right? I you might remember I said we could essentially pick a bill uh, an infinite amount of lines, right? As long as they separate blue the blue data from the red data, it is correct. It fulfills everything. It fulfills our accuracy measure. The only reason we're here is, did we give it a seed? Uh, we gave it a seed. We told it it's random state zero. We can put in any other number there. We can put in a random number there. We will get different results. Because machine learning uh, models, when they train, do not produce uh, this, um, deterministic answers. We don't know what we're gonna get out. And this is because, if you remember, or have taken mathematical optimization, sure, you can look, there's the minima, but this is not, and this is two-dimensional, so actually, yes, you can draw the minima, but usually, you cannot draw the minima. It's a landscape with many minima. Um, and for this, yes, there would be an infinite number of lines. And what we're asking for is, given these data points, what does something out here look like? That's essentially what we're asking when we're saying put in M MNIST or put in something we just haven't trained for or haven't seen. And the answer, just like these infinite number of lines, is we don't know. We, we would get something. So when you say it, it would work, uh, it would. It would produce a result. Accuracy would be low or maybe high. It would try its best to throw in MNIST in one of these 10 categories, but it would not read it, right? It would not understand what it's looking at. Um, many, there have been many ideas that you should add an extra class called unknown and uh, try and handle this. I think this goes in under explainable AI, mostly, uh, a big research field where, where this is an, a common topic, like how do you handle, or how do you handle, how do you detect uh, I think they call out of set, out of set examples or something like that, uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, oh, you trained it? Uh, wait, was that? Oh yeah, you. So you took MNIST as the test set, but you trained. Yeah. So it. Well, okay. The the fine work. So for me, that is, it did not work. Right, it 
it can only classify 0 0.1. That is a, a monkey guessing, right? If you have to uh, categorize uh, 10, 0 to 9, uh, and you do it with zero point uh, with ten percent accuracy. That's a monkey choosing. Uh, so, but it but it doesn't break, and that is the problem here, right? Uh, and this is um, again, I should have shown you more loads of examples of cool video recognition and and things. But you can Google that, and you can find everything. You can find uh, these um, uh, fake videos of Trump uh, speaking or Obama and so on. The point is. This, uh, what we're talking about now, is how you break facial recognition, for instance. Or, uh, so if you've seen cars that have this kind of weird pattern or a t-shirt with like a weird pattern on it, this is exactly that. You know what uh, the network is looking for, or you know exactly what the network does not understand. So you're breaking it in different ways. Um, maybe I was a bit unclear, so let me rephrase that. So when you put a special pattern on your t-shirt, for instance, you know that this pattern is exactly what the gradient is looking for. So it will classify my t-shirt as a, a car, for instance, because it does not, it, it, it does not understand what it's looking at. It only knows that when I get an image that I've been trained on, this is the pattern I look for, and then I know it's a car. Uh, in the same way, if you get something you've never seen before, your the network is trying its best to fit it into some category that it's seen before, but it's basing it on nothing. And this is a huge problem when what you're looking at, for instance, could be, I go back to medical, I'm sorry, that's what I work with on a daily basis. But you know, if someone comes in with a broken leg, but it's a leg you've never seen before, or when we have um, MRI scans, you know, if it's someone with a slightly different body type, maybe your training set was only a thousand people because you couldn't get more images. It's a big legal battle to get images. Well, what do you do then? Well, okay, the patient was rushed to surgery because your AI said, something was wrong when it wasn't or you found cancer when there wasn't they, and these are really difficult tasks you and again we're talking about quite small networks this just explodes uh, when it becomes bigger because you cannot test for everything or you cannot train for everything um, and then what you try and do is you decrease complexity so we talked about that a bit and, and sorry please stop me if i'm just mumbling or talking too much uh, but uh, there is no, there. I didn't talk about the disadvantages, there are some uh, between uh, deep learning, um, sorry, now I am mumbling. So deep learning usually means it's a network that has depth, so several uh, hidden layers and so on that we've been talking about. But there's nothing wrong with having sev different models after each other. Uh, the disadvantage is maybe you don't learn as fast or maybe you don't, you can't handle every eventuality. But adding some human know-how, some engineering moxie uh, can also help. So say you have a very complicated problem, go back to our stop signs. What about having one network that finds stop in an image? If that's convolutional, it doesn't matter, but that's its task. And then a second network would identify what type of sign it is. And then a third network uh, converts the, the answer into text, maybe. There's nothing wrong with that. It's slightly more difficult to train all three, and, uh, but you're more robust because the, you're doing input check at every step. And that can decrease some of these problems. And all these free networks can be quite simple. Whereas if you build one large one, it might be very complex. And as we've said before, complex networks require perhaps more input, but might require a lot of input yeah, to train. Did I have anything else? I think I just have kind of our outro. Do you have any more questions? Otherwise we're going to be done quite quick. Uh, and again, sorry if I've chatted far too much, but uh, 
And maybe I like my, the sound of my voice a bit. Great question. Uh, chance is probably the best answer. Uh, so uh, I don't know. We've not talked age or we haven't talked education or anything. Uh, if you want, I'll go. If there aren't any actual questions, I'll jump to that because I think we've talked about what we've done and, and where you should go from here. Uh, sorry about that motorbike. Uh, so I did my PhD in particle physics. Uh, why would I recommend a PhD? I wouldn't recommend that to my worst enemy. Uh, it's it's hard. Uh, politics, social, all that. Um, but if you love it, I think you should give it a go. And it opens a lot of doors. Uh, and if you have that in the back of your head that you're doing this for future, uh, for to get a glimpse into research, you're doing a very cool project and you want to open up doors for the future, then I think it's very much worth it. Uh, I was at CERN, not sure if you know about that, big particle accelerator in Switzerland. Uh, loved it, but I wouldn't stay, even if someone paid me. Uh, got into machine learning through them, and then I started working for AFRI, and they literally contacted me from the local hospital saying, hey, we need someone who knows AI. Can you come work for us? Um, so, heck, why not? Uh, I think my dream is always to be in the medical field. Um, I think I will always be in it. Uh, fun to say I'm actually leaving it in about 20 days. Uh, I, I resigned from the position there because, uh, again, the world is a bit more complicated uh, than maybe it, it should be. So uh, for me, I went into medicine to make a difference. And not just because the AI is cool, but I actually want to make sure that patients are, are, are get better treatment. And then it turns out it's better to work for a company doing medical research and developing products more than for an actual hospital or a university doing research itself, which is a shame, but that's what it looks like right now. Uh, ask me in a few years, maybe I'll, I'll change my mind. But uh, And to flip that around, if you want to get into the medical field, there are all kinds of possibilities. Uh, they're maybe not listed, but you know, just send an email to university. If you're not already working for AFRI, send an email to AFRI and you can come work for us doing that as well. Um, also, if you're interested, more interested in this, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or something. Um, any other questions about me or today or machine learning in general? or anyone who wants to say what they're doing. So this is what we should have been doing while we were eating pizza. Uh, we'll have to have a physical meetup as soon as everything blows over. Yeah. Yeah, you had showed one uh, video on they were tracking all the people right so they'll usually have a class in which it will also show just emptiness mm -hmm. like so they will train it as per how the floor would look if it was empty uh, for this um no for this i think they've only trained it for uh ob yeah exactly sorry so uh class zero which would be empty ha has to be in there as well So for anything you train, you have to have the positive and the negative. So here you would have to have, uh, if we go back, you'd have to have images with people in it and also without. Uh, but as we were saying before, right, you can then split this into maybe two algorithms. One that sees, is there anything here uh, or not, and then you pass on the the boxes essentially to the second algorithm to say, is this interesting, or is this the floor, or is this flies, or anything like that. Real life applications for reinforcement learning. Anything? I mean, 
it can be used for so much. Uh, it could be used for self-driving cars, for instance. Uh, it could be used for banking. It could be used for finance. Um, the problem is twofold. One is uh, how well it works compared to other techniques. Uh, so even in theory, if we sit down and say it should work this well, uh, it might not. It might there. It might be that another technique works better. Uh, and secondly, um, depending on where you go, it's not sure that you will find a company that uses this. Uh, so I worked a while. Uh, I was a consultant a while for a huge company in logistics. You would think logistics. They must be using self-driving um, trucks. They must be using uh, machine learning on big data. Uh, nope, and or sorry, yes, they had self-driving trucks. Nope, they ha didn't have big data. And then you look into their self-driving trucks and you realize it's essentially a bunch of if statements. There's very little machine learning, uh, unfortunately, because they have a very, very simple problem. And they've been doing it for so many years that they have a massive amount of code, uh, a massive code base, and uh, that is essentially if statements and they don't want to change and then the problem is more where do we go with this so um again going back to medic medical research right we don't write models anymore we don't have to google does facebook does but we take them uh we take the architecture and we apply it and that works perfect for us we have the difficulty in finding good data and good representation of patients or legality or politics, but not in the actual uh, model writing. <clears throat> so we should look in the we should look to be an application engineer rather than development engineer. Uh, yes, if you want to have fun with machine learning. In again, in my opinion, uh, if you want to do. Because last time someone asked me this, right? Why do you do you want to develop machine learning algorithms? Then yes, you go to Google or you go to Facebook, uh, that or you go to a mathematical department at a university. Everywhere else will be applying, and applying is, in my mind, so much cooler, because you can do it almost anywhere. You just have to find, find where to do it, and then uh, unfortunately, you have to be able to make money off it. Great. So what do you say? Are we done for tonight? I think we covered a lot of interesting things. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Uh, I hope you got a, a good start uh, into all this. I hope I've left you with good things to read up on. But I think, at least from my part, essentially we've started from scratch we haven't touched everything of course there's so much but i think i've brought you into today and uh, and mentioned most of the problems that exist uh why tensorflow well it's google uh, it's very big could you use pytorch of course you can could you use sklearn or things like that of course you can uh, it's mostly to find an abstract abstraction level uh that works well for you there's one i think it's called ml auto or something which is one step higher as well uh, makes everything easier it depends what you're doing and where you want to put the level i think ml auto i'm not that good with it but there are other packages uh, that makes it much easier that you just literally say here's data this is what i want out and it does everything for you i would say play around with everything uh, and of course, there is there are free courses on Coursera, and you know it depends a bit on what you want to do. If you're just doing this because you're interested, well, look into everything. Look into all the details. If this is something you want to work with for applications, uh, then I would say try a bit of everything. Make up examples. Uh, I mentioned uh, Kaggle before. That is a great place to start because they have proper examples that you can work through and loads of examples of 
how people have written code. Uh, but otherwise, thank you ever so much. Uh, and oh, there. Uh, also, ML. Uh, yes. Uh, so, also ML. Uh, it's it's quality versus uh, quality versus um, practicality. So, auto ML does not work very well. I can write better models than they can. I can choose better models than they can, because I know I, I've been doing this for a while. So, it's not that they're bad. I mean, they are very good, but I can do better. However, if it's too hard for me, I like if I were to ch change fields, right, and from medical where I know all this to some or data to something else to self-driving cars, then I'd probably no self-driving cars. I'd probably just ask Tesla what kind of architecture they're using. But you see my picture, right? Where this doesn't matter. Where I just want something quick. Sure, Auto ML will work fine. It could be a first prototype, for instance. If I have a new data set I've never worked with, I, I just use that. But after a while, you realize you can tweak it better yourself. And this might change. There might be another version. I mean, TensorFlow wasn't that good in the beginning either, but now it is very good. Uh, and mostly it handles all the GPU stuff, uh, which uh, before you go into that, and maybe you want to, uh, handling GPU stuff yourself oh, oh, is a massive headache, uh, especially writing code that runs on your computer with one GPU, and then you need it to, to be able to run on your server that has four or 18 GPUs. TensorFlow does that brilliantly. PyTorch does that brilliantly. I'm not sure anyone else does that at all without you having to do a lot yourself, and I've had to do that a few times. So. But otherwise, thank you very much, guys. Uh, again, find me on LinkedIn. You have my name. Uh, and otherwise, I will probably see you at another GDG meeting, meetup. Have a great evening. Take care.